This is the story of how a top secret German helicopter piloted by one of the Luftwaffe's best ever pilots came to crash on the south coast of England. Now if that wasn't crazy enough, some even say that the helicopter is still buried somewhere here to this day. This is RF Beaulieu, it's the site of the Second World War airfield in the New Forest, Hampshire, on the south coast of England. During wartime, both bombers and fighter planes left from here, although there's not huge amounts of evidence left. But there are some very fascinating stories about this place, and none more so than one about a German helicopter that crashed here in 1945. But more intriguingly, when I found out that the helicopter was being piloted by one of the Luftwaffe's most revered pilots of the Second World War, and that the wreckage is potentially buried here, according to some online reports at least. I just knew I had to find out more. If the part about the buried wreckage is true, then it has the potential to be one of the most fascinating New Forest wartime stories ever told. The story starts with a gentleman named Heinrich Fokker. He was a German inventor who jointly founded the Fokker Wolf Aviation Company in 1923, which initially developed civil aircraft However, once the Nazis came to power 10 years later, he was soon ousted from the company he'd actually founded, and some say because he was deemed to be too politically unreliable in the eyes of the ruling party. However, the Nazi air ministry soon realised that Heinrich's skills were actually something they could not do without, and this was based on his rather impressive feat of creating what many consider to be the first ever fully functional helicopter, as we understand helicopter design in modern times, and that was the Fokker Wolf FW61 in 1936, just before the Nazis had actually sacked him off. So, with that decision looking a little bit hasty, he was brought back into the fold, and it was suggested to him that he set up a new company focused purely on helicopter design. In April 1937, Heinrich Fokker and the pilot Gerd Achelis set up the imaginatively titled Fokker Achelis Company. Their brief and very simple terms was to develop a better designed helicopter that was capable of carrying a 700 kilogram payload. And by 1939, with the outbreak of the Second World War, the vision was starting to become a reality. And in the same month that war was declared, the first prototype of the Fokker Achelis 223 Draka, aka the Dragon, was developed at the Delman Horse factory close to Bremen. However, it did take some time for the teething problems of the Draka to be fully ironed out. And it wasn't until August of 1940 that the German helicopter was able to hover independently without being tethered to the ground. And then just two months later, the Fokker Achelis 223 Draka set a top speed of 113 miles per hour and managed to reach an altitude of over 23,000 feet. It truly was a remarkable piece of engineering with very advanced capability for its time. In fact, nobody had ever come close to creating anything quite like it. But it would still take some time and design iterations until it was considered that the Draka was ready for military service and the Nazis wanted a helicopter that could be used during wartime for tasks such as rescue operations or transporting people or gear from inaccessible places. And by 1942, it was felt that the latest version, the version 3 V3, ticked those boxes and was ready to be put into mass production. However, as you will learn as we progress through this story, nothing would ever be straightforward as far as the Fokker Achelis 223 Draka goes. In 1942, for example, Allied forces identified the factory at Delmenhorst as being of significant importance, and one night in June, the factory was devastated in a bombing raid. The facility was flattened, and all of Heinrich's work was destroyed, and with it, the helicopter prototypes for V2 and V3. So at this point in time, only 10 helicopters had ever been completed, and they were all now reduced to a pile of twisted metal, broken glass, and scrap. So the powers that be decided to relocate the factory to a place called Laupheim near Stuttgart. In 1943, the development proceeded further when version 11 of the Draka crashed whilst on a rescue mission. Now whilst that might sound like a setback, they actually used another iteration, V14, to go rescue the crashed one. During the mission, the version 14 managed to make five flights in total, picking up pieces of the crashed helicopter with its winch every time. So this actually demonstrated the capability of how the 223 Draka could potentially be used once it was in mass production. This successful mission was piloted by Lieutenant Helmut Gershenhauer. Now remember that name because Gershenhauer is going to have a very large part to play once the story reaches the UK, but more about that shortly. Subsequent tests were carried out, including the dropping of troops in mountainous terrain, supplying of troops in difficult to reach places, and even more testing to assess the suitability for heavy cargo and rescue operations. 
and there was now an appetite within the Nazi leadership to ramp up production of the Achelis Draka, but before that initiative could start, the Allied bombing put pay to any development yet again, because in July of 1944, bombs fell on the Lautheim factory. Only seven helicopters that have been made so far managed to survive. That was versions 11 through to 17. But not to be deterred. The production of the Draka was moved to Tempelhof in Berlin. So you can't really say that the Germans weren't tenacious when it came to persevering with the project, but that just goes to show how much faith they had in Heinrich Fokker's helicopter. In fact, the belief in the Draka and Heinrich Fokker was so strong that the Nazis ordered the Fokker Achelis organization to ramp things up and produce 400 helicopters a month. Now, you're probably gonna guess that things didn't go quite to plan. And you'd be right, because by the end of January 1945, only four Drakas had actually been completed at the new Tempelhof base. I think it's fair to say, you wouldn't want to be in Heinrich Fokker's shoes at this point. Despite their best intentions, Nazi Germany were failing with their helicopter program. A mix of Allied bombing, delays in testing, and accidents meant that during wartime, only 11 Drakas were actually ever flown during 1940s Germany. That equated to just 400 hours flying time in total. A very poor return on investment, I surely agree. However, once Drakka did enter active service during the war with the Luftwaffe, and it was commandeered by the expert pilot Hans Helmut Gershenhauer, do you remember him? Well, this is where his story starts properly and where the story will eventually end with a crash on Heathland in the New Forest of England. In August of 1942, the experienced German pilot Helmut Gershenhauer was assigned to the Fokker Achelis project. Now, Gershenhauer was no ordinary pilot. He was an aircraft engineer a graduate from engineering college and was probably one of, if not the most experienced, of German helicopter pilots. So it was his job to support Fokker in testing the FA-223 Draka with test flights in the Austrian Alps. By 1945, Gershenhauer had been witness to the stop and start nature of this project, with the Draka yet to see any active service during the war. But that was soon about to change for Gershenhauer, as the Fokker Achelis factory received a message from the Nazi High Command on the 25th of February 1945. By order of the Führer, Gerschenhauer and two colleagues were told to fly the Draka from Tempelhof in Berlin to Danzig on the Baltic coast. The reason for this mission has never truly been revealed, however, it is probable that the plan was that the Draka helicopter would help rescue Karl Hanker, who was a leading Nazi. He was besieged in the city of Breslau as the Soviet Red Army was beginning an advance. And as with the story, so far, a common theme of failure runs through it, so you won't be surprised to hear that the possible rescue mission ordered by Hitler was actually unsuccessful. However, that blame can't really be placed with Gershenhauer or the Draka, because in fact the failed mission proved just how good the FA-223 Draka helicopter actually was. Here's what happened. Gershenhauer and his two colleagues took off. According to reports, they'd already named themselves the Himmelschfahrt Kommando, which is roughly translated as the Heavenbound Squadron, so that gives you some insight to how they thought this mission might end, and they weren't actually far off in truth, because the journey was plagued from the beginning. There was a lack of fuel on the pit stops due to Allied bombing raids, there were terrible weather conditions, and they also had to take diversions due to enemies advancing into landing zones along the way. It really wasn't going well, and in fact, the inability to find sufficient refueling stops meant that next time they did manage to find fuel on a stop, Gershenhauer actually took a fuel drum and a hand pump on board the Draka itself and was pumping fuel into the tank whilst in flight. This type of procedure was never in the manual. By the time the Draka and crew approached Danzig, they were flying over the invading Red Army. Not a great position to be in for a helicopter low on fuel. The rescue mission had become so perilous they were ordered to return and made the journey back to Tempelhof in Berlin, making more dangerous stops along the way. Now, whilst this might sound like an abject failure again in the life of the FA-223 Draka, it actually served to prove the complete opposite, because the epic journey had lasted over two weeks, and in that time, Gershenhauer and his two-man crew had covered 1,041 miles in a helicopter, crossing battle zones, encountering terrible weather conditions, and having to stop for refuelling. So in total, they'd flown for 16 hours and 25 minutes. This was a feat that was previously unimaginable. It actually showed that this version of the Fokker Achelis helicopter was operationally ready to enter active service and production needed to be initiated. But, as is the story of the Draka, this was not to be. The war was coming to an end and the Allied forces were now closing in. The war was coming to a conclusion. 
The Allied and Soviet forces were taking territory daily, meaning the Germans were retreating at speed. Three of the surviving Draka helicopters were now based in German-controlled Austrian territory, and as the US 80th Infantry advanced, the German helicopter division retreated over the border into Germany to a district called Einring. Two of the Draka helicopters managed to get back into Germany, but the optimism was short-lived as soon after both were captured by the US Army. Rather than destroy the two German helicopters, the Army handed them over to the team responsible for Operation Lusty. Operation Lusty stood for Luftwaffe Secret Technology. This was a project set up by the US Intelligence Service to gain access to German aircraft, technical and scientific reports, research facilities and weapons to take back and study in the United States. However, it wasn't just the US who wanted to take advantage of Heinrich Fokker's work. France and the UK also wanted to get their hands on the Draca helicopters. There were some disagreements between the three countries, but once the US realised they only had room for one Draca on an aircraft carrier returning to the States, the UK was able to commandeer the other one. The fate of the one commandeered by the Americans has never truly been established as there's no record of what happened to it once it reached the United States. But what we do know for certain is that one FA-223 Draca was handed to British forces and then had to get to England for testing. But there was a problem here as there were no Allied pilots who knew how to fly the Draca helicopter and there was no room on a ship once they actually managed to get the Draca to the French coast. So this is where Gershenhauer enters our story again. He was now a prisoner of war and being the most experienced Luftwaffe pilot for helicopters, there was, well, uh, let's just say he kindly offered his services to help, or maybe he was politely asked to, we'll never know for sure, but as you can guess, this was to be no ordinary journey, because no helicopter had ever flown across the English Channel, so this was to be yet another first achieved by Gershenhauer and the Draca. So, accompanied by an RAF officer and a US counterpart, the Draca, piloted by Gershenhauer, left mainland Europe from the coast of France, it was escorted by a British plane, which was also carrying two German engineers, and they all finally arrived at their English destination in late September of 1945. And this is the point where the connection to the New Forest in England will start, as I will describe in the next chapter. Gershenhauer and his allied crew landed the Draca at RAF Bewley on the south coast of England. The reason this airfield in Hampshire was chosen was because it was the home to the Airborne Forces Experimental Establishment, also known as the AFEE. The AFEE had only recently moved to this new forest base and they were there to conduct research and development into non-traditional air operations including gliders, rotary wing aircraft and parachute drops. So it was the perfect place for the FA-223 Draca to be examined in order for the English Air Force to extract as much secret technology as they could with the help, of course, of Gershenhauer and the two German engineers. So, once they landed at RF Bewley, the German prisoners of war worked alongside the British personnel. The following is an extract from an audio interview with Fred Hambly. He was in the Air Force at the time the helicopter and the Germans came to RF Bewley. Because we'd had these German aircraft, we'd also brought some uh, uh, German technicians over with them, uh, equipment to us, airmen, and, and a Nazi type officer and they were housed in a small compound the other side of the road and uh, uh, we you know we mixed with them during the working day and they were okay they were just ordinary lads. The officer was a bit of a pig and um, I remember one occasion where squad leader Cable, our boss, uh, happened to be in the hangar when he was uh, shouting at his men and he called him to one side and in no uncertain terms told him we don't do that in this country. Uh, much to our amusement and uh, to, I think to the amusement of the German troops. Whether Fred Hambly is referring to Gershenhauer as being the pig of an officer, I don't know. Over the next few weeks the Draca was subjected to tests and inspections by the RAF. This included two test flights over RAF Bewley which despite Gershenhauer's objections, often involved having more than the recommended three people on board, and it was test flight number three where things went very wrong. It was October the 3rd, 1945. Gershenhauer took off from RF Bewley with three personnel on board, and whilst hovering above the airfield at 18 metres off the ground, the rotor blades failed, causing the helicopter to descend rapidly, hitting the ground with considerable force. The reason for the mechanical failure was described in the memoirs of Alan Brown, who worked for the FAEE. 
Continuing the theme of misfortune and bad planning we've seen during the Drakkar's history, Alan Brown said that the engine mountings were to blame as, and rather specifically, every 25 hours steel housing that secured the engine had to be tightened using a special tool. Now apparently that special tool was never brought over to England, so despite Gershenhau's protestations the tests had continued to be made in less than optimum circumstances. But thankfully Gershenhauer and the RAF personnel all escaped without serious injury. However, the Draco was not so lucky. This particular model had only completed 170 hours of flying time, yet within days of arriving in England it was damaged so badly it could not be repaired. As for what happened to Gershenhauer, let me hand over to Fred Hamley again with what he saw in the immediate aftermath of the helicopter crash at RAF Bewley. The twin rotor uh, crashed and um the last we knew that they were taken away, whether they got repatriated home or whether they went to a prison war, another prison war camp, we, we never found out. The helicopter crash in RF Bewley marked the end of Gershenhauer's flying career. He was released as a prisoner of war in April 1946 and he'd never fly a helicopter again. He returned to Germany and was known to be still alive and living in a retirement home near Dortmund as recently as 2013. But what became of the Dracker wreck? This is where the story gets a little bit murky. The spot I'm on now, it's, it's very probable this is where the Draca 223 would have crashed because this part, just to the north of the airfield, is where the AF E did all their helicopter testing. The control tower would have been around this area, possibly where that horse is. And then just behind us there are the hangars where the helicopter, the Draca, would have been stored during its short time in England. The fact that there are a couple of online reports saying that the Draca was buried here adds an amazing layer of intrigue to what was already a really fascinating story. So what exactly is the truth about the Draca? Well, we know for certain it crossed the channel, first ever helicopter to do so. We know it was flown by Gerstenhauer, and we know it ended up here for testing. But what is not so certain is the aspects about the burial. So there's two online reports, and I think we need to just take into consideration a little bit first the source of those reports. I've only found a reference to the Draca being buried here at RF Bewley in two places. That's two websites, they use exactly the same text and they quote exactly the same source, a newspaper report from 2005. Now in my mind, if there was a newspaper report from 2005, you would expect to be able to find that online, given the age of the internet that we're now in. I also can't find anything in historical records that mention a burial. Not that that should discount it at all, because actually on World War II airfields like this, there are stories of aircraft being pushed into burial pits and burned and destroyed. So I decided to ask a few experts. Now, if you want to see the full text of what those experts told me, and that's including historians and archaeologists, go to rfbewley.co.uk slash Draca. But anyway, in a brief synopsis, this is kind of what they said. The experts seem to think that it's probably a no. Not that they're discounting it was buried at all, because as I said a moment ago, there are reports of burial pits being used at airfields, but the general consensus would be that if it had happened here at RAF Bewley, those burial pits may be temporary and could have been then unfilled and taken to scrap post-war potentially. There's also the consideration that LIDAR scans of the ground which show disturbances of the earth, it doesn't really show much that could point to an aircraft burial pit here. And by the way, this is the hangar here that the Draca would have been on, or the site of the hangar, at least. Obviously it's been destroyed now, but you can still see the groundwork. So overall, my gut feeling is, and that's based on uncorroborated evidence, is that there is no Draca buried here. And actually, the only people who really know for certain, they'll have passed away now. It could be that other people heard the story and thought it sounded fun. So they just decided to run with it. And why not? It's an amazing story after all. And the thing is, that's just how urban legends begin, isn't it? Does it really need to be proven though? I mean, after all, it's just a really good story. And who knows, after me making this video, I might have actually further contributed to the myths of the new forest airfield. So until next time, hope to see you soon.